Good morning, and welcome to worship on this Holy Trinity Sunday. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire community of Agnus Day, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. This Sunday, Holy Trinity Sunday, is the only feast of the church year named after a doctrine of the church. But it's really more a celebration of the mystery of God. God, who is one, is also three, and yet somehow no less one. God, who is divine, is also human, and somehow each nature makes the other more real. God is simultaneously absent and yet also imminently present. As we enter into the season after Pentecost, we begin by meditating on this mystery and contemplating our place within it. Before we begin our worship, I'll invite us to take just a moment to share prayer requests from our community. You may share any prayers of concern or gratitude that you have in the chat or in the comments, being mindful of privacy in this public space. You will also have the opportunity to include your prayers during the intercessory prayers before we celebrate Holy Communion. I'll invite you now to turn to your bulletin as we continue with the order of service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I invite you to join me in our hymn. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
Almighty Creator and ever-living God, we worship your glory, eternal, three in one. We praise your power, majestic, one in three. Keep us steadfast in this faith. Defend us in all adversity and bring us at last into your presence where you live in endless joy and love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading today is from Romans 8, 12 through 17. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it. You don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, You are a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses was lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave the only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have been Lutheran all my life. I've been a pastor for nine years. From the very time that I was born, all I have ever heard from my parents, my pastors, my Sunday school teachers, my seminary professors, and everyone else is that God loves me no matter what I do, that I do not have to earn that love or prove myself in any way. That's the only message that I have ever preached as a pastor. And yet, after all these years, I'm still baffled by how often I hear people doubt that. Oh, they would, wouldn't say that they doubt it, of course, but I hear it in their questions. I see it in their fears. They express concern when they are doubting what they've been taught to believe their whole lives. They worry that their loved ones who aren't Christian uh, might be going to hell. They have a hard time struggling and wrestling with how to accept someone whose religion or whose sexuality or gender identity doesn't fit with what they learned were correct. After all these years, I'm still occasionally surprised by how prolific that doubt is. I'm still surprised that I see it even in myself. After all that I have heard, all that I have seen, that I might still doubt the truth of that love. I still get frustrated with myself for not being the kind of Christian or the kind of pastor that I think I ought to be that I think God wants me to be. I still get defensive when others, especially people that I love, turn away from the Christian faith to seek truth in other places. In my honest moments, I can admit to myself that all of that comes from the fear that maybe God's love isn't as simple or as universal and comprehensive as I say it is. 
we've all heard these verses today. For God so loved the world, but something in us causes us to doubt or to reject or to predicate that love on something else. We make that love contingent upon our belief of it or on moral action on our part or on good intention. But that's not what the story says. In spite of how many times we've heard it, we still wonder, how could God love the world? How could God love me? Nicodemus, the Pharisee, shows up today to talk to Jesus because Jesus has just trashed the temple. Nicodemus is understandably confused. This teacher who claims to be from God has now upended God's house. And so he wonders, if you are from God, why would you do this? In other words, he's asking, who is this God that you claim to be from? Jesus responds with some perplexing words about birth and wind and then explains with a story. God so loved the world, he says. This is Jesus' way of explaining to Nicodemus who God is. God cannot be known apart from love. Love is in God's character. Or to put a finer point on it, God is love. Love is is who God is. This is the truth to which our concept or our doctrine of Trinity bears witness. As I said earlier, Trinity Sunday is a celebration of the mystery of God who is one and yet also three. It's a feast day devoted to this nature of God. What Trinity helps us to see is that God cannot be known apart from relationship. In fact, God is relationship. God is love. We can't know the Father apart from the Son or apart from the Spirit. We can't know any of them except in relation to one another. Theologians sometimes describe Trinity like a dance in which the three twirl around so closely and so quickly that they soon become indistinguishable from one another. God is known primarily In fact, only in God's love for God's own self, in the Father's love for the Son's love for the Spirit. That love is intrinsic to who God is. Without that love, the very idea of God doesn't even make sense. But it doesn't stop there. When God created everything that is the Creator or the Parent, conceived of an idea. Each of those ideas came into existence as the word was spoken. It took on a life of its own as the breath entered into it. In other words, each and everything that exists is a piece of God, an idea that began in God and was given form by God and given life by God. Each and everything that is animate and inanimate is an expression of of God. Mountains, forests, sunsets, bluebirds, butterflies, all of them reveal something about God, even tapeworms and tree slugs. They reveal something of God because they are all expressions of God's creativity, all manifestations of God's love. They all live or happen or have been formed within the creation that God has made. Because each and everything in creation is an expression of God, they are all united in God. And through God, they are united with one another. It's not that different from how the parent and the son and the spirit are united in divinity and yet also somehow separate. Trinity describes the unity and also the distinctness of the three. And that also describes the unity of God with a creation that is yet somehow distinct from God. This means that in loving God's creation, God is also loving God's own self. 
God loves each plant or animal or star or atom because each of those things is an expression of God's own self. Love is the recognition that God has of God's own self in each created thing. They are not God and they are not God's and neither is God those things but each of those things is in God and God is in them. Confused yet? I know I am. But there's more. Because each and every created thing also, of course, includes us. St. Paul writes, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. St. John testifies to Jesus saying, As the Father abides in me, I abide in you. Beneath all of our complex motivations and flawed character traits, at the very core of our being, the life that animates us is the life of God, given by the Holy Spirit. The one who lives in us, our deepest, truest, inmost self, is Christ. And that is not an easy reality to accept, let alone understand. It's not what we see every day as people hurt and steal from and fear and abuse and betray one another. The reality that we see, the physical reality, suggests that this truth to which the evangelists and the apostles point is false or mistaken somehow. And we are inclined to trust it because we live, as Paul says, according to the flesh according to what we can see and hear and feel. We believe that ourselves, instead of being united with all the other creatures in God, actually stop at the limits of our flesh. We consider the biochemical processes of our cells to be the full extent of life. And so we hurt and steal and fear and abuse and betray in order to protect and to prolong that life. Such life, according to the flesh, is all about me. I think and I act and I live only for myself, whether to exalt myself or save myself or fulfill myself or comfort myself or punish myself. To live instead according to the Spirit is to see and to acknowledge and to trust the reality that we are not, in fact, separate and isolated from one another and from the rest of creation and from God, but that in God we are in union with all that is, with all people, all creatures, all creation. It is to trust that God is at the deepest core of who I am, the light that shines within me, the breath that gives me life. That God's love for me is identical with God's love for God's own self. That God loves me for the same reason that God loves, that the, that the parent loves the son, the son or that the spirit loves the parent. And so my love for you and your love for me are also identical with God's love for us and our love for God. And so this wild and crazy dance of the Trinity includes all of us and all creation. Life according to the Spirit means that knowing that you, whoever you are, wherever you are from, whatever you have done or not done, whatever you believe or don't believe, you are infinitely beloved by God because God recognizes God's own self in you. I really believe that this is what these stories are trying to say. But we will never believe that truth about ourselves until we can believe it about everyone else, including and perhaps especially about those people whom we dislike and distrust the most. God so loved the world, he says. There's something you need to know here. That when Jesus says world, 
He's not talking about creation in general or about the planet Earth. The word that he, refu- that he uses refers to all the powers and the forces and the systems that actively reject and resist God. He's talking about the darkness, as St. John might say, that blinds people to the light of God. He's talking about God's enemies, about the people of this age, this corrupt generation. For God so loved God's enemies that God became one of them in order to give them life, to give them God's own life. Not to condemn the world, but to save it. That is the love that God has for us. The love, the kind of love that it is impossible for us to know among one another. Excuse me, the kind of love that is possible for us to know among one another. Love that actively seeks the benefit of that which it hates most, or which most hates it. If you're thinking that sounds impossible, apparently I am too. You're not alone. A little Freudian slip there. I wonder if even the saints and mystics on their best days are only able to manage this kind of love in fits and spurts. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, we say. And we are, after all, people of the flesh, born of the flesh, living according to the flesh. That doesn't mean that we're wrong or bad. It just means that we can't yet see the reality that God is dying to show us. There is no hell greater than the illusion of separation which we create for ourselves. The illusion in which we futilely compete against our very selves for what we already have. We can't help it. It's just the way we're born. But somehow, within that mystical dance of Trinity, a new possibility arises. Somehow, in this mysterious and infinite love, we are reborn over and over and over again. As the divine image of God within us puts that flesh to death and makes us something new, a creation born of the Spirit. How does that work? I have no idea. The wind blows where it will. All I know is that as I come to know the truth of this mystery more fully and more intimately, I can see and I can feel myself becoming more open, more loving, more like the spirit into which I am being reborn. St. John wrote that it's impossible for me to love God whom I have not seen when I cannot love a sibling whom I have seen. I wonder if I cannot even love my siblings until I'm able to love myself. Thankfully, in the mystery of the Trinity, love is multidirectional. The love of the people around me can help me love them and myself and God more fully because love is from God. God is love. Within the dance of Trinity, God is loving God ever more fully. And through that mystery, we are all a part of that mystical rebirth.
Let us come together before the triune God. We pray, O God, for your church around the earth. Revitalize us and renew us that we may be reborn through the blowing wind of your spirit. We thank you for the variety of people and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of friendship. Show us your presence in those who differ from us most. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for your power revealed to us in creation, for cedar and oak trees, for rushing waters, for the echoes of thunder. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations and for our leaders that led by your spirit, they work for a world where all of your children enjoy peace. Prepare us to be bearers of reconciliation wherever you place us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for healing for all those who suffer, especially victims and survivors of trauma or violence. We pray for healing for those with PTSD. Give respite to all those who are mentally troubled. Flood their paths with light. Turn their eyes to skies full of promise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this worshiping community that the splendor of your majesty and holiness of your mystery may be glorified at Agnes Day. Teach us how to fulfill our mission simply and surely so that you may, be, may shine through our worship and our relationships with one another. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the lives of those who have died, especially for those who we name now aloud or in our hearts. For what and for whom do the people pray? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our homes to receive the Lord's Supper, let us pray. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, we give you thanks for your life-sustaining love with which you have always guided us. When the flood came, you provided an ark. When the plagues came, you provided refuge. When the evening came, you provided a pillar of fire. When the exile came, you provided a new song. Day after day after day, your love has remained steadfast. Day after day after day. In your boundless love, you provided for us a Savior, Jesus Christ, who healed the sick, gave strength to the weak, restored hope to the desolate, and proclaimed the good news of your coming reign in peace and justice. Day after day after day, he laid down his life for us. Day after day after day. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he'd given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, beloved Christ, in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our anxiety, in the midst of our longing, in the midst of our impatience, heal us, strengthen us, give us hope. Day after day after day, let us hear and let us proclaim good news. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, with this bread and cup, the body and blood of Christ, unite us with all who gather at this table. Unite us across space and time, across social distance and social divides, across party lines and national borders. Filled with the breath of God and fed with the body of Christ, day after day after day, raise us to new life in you. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, we praise your name with all our life and our breath and our strength, together with all your creatures, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal this morning, then receive this blessing. May the God of love be ever in, with, and under you as you are sent to the world. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, then hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you.
This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the God who has brought us from death to life fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd like to share just a few announcements. First, on Sunday, June 13th, we'll be recognizing graduates from our congregation during worship. We'll be presenting gifts to our high school grads and sending them with a blessing. But we'll also be congratulating those who are graduating from college or grad school. Uh, I hope that you will be able to join us uh, for that event on the 13th. Also, just a reminder that anyone who'd like to work uh, on helping with either the community garden or the refugee resettlement project can contact Sister Anne to be put in touch with those groups, uh, the groups of people who are working on those things. Finally, uh, we are now able to look forward to gathering in person again beginning on July 25th. We know that not everyone will be ready to come back yet for many different reasons, and we have members of our community who are joining us from too far to travel. When in-person worship resumes, we will be continuing to stream our worship online. It's our goal to worship in a way that fully includes and honors both our physically and our digitally gathered community. We will no longer be doing pre-recorded worship like this, but we will be streaming what's happening in the sanctuary. And it's going to take us a little bit of time to figure out what that looks like to create a worship experience that's meaningful for everyone and engaging for everyone. So I ask your grace while we think about that. We are continuing to work on that over these next few weeks to hopefully uh, come up with something, but it will definitely be a work in progress, something that grows along with us. And so I just wanted to um, reiterate that we are committed to offering a space for worship that serves our entire congregation both online and offline. Thank you for being a part of this community. It is good for us to gather as God's people, to be renewed in faith and reassured of God's promises. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel where On You Stay gathers for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. Um, and be sure to find us on the web at onyoustaylutheran.org where you can get involved with Bible studies and service groups and many other ministries that are happening both online and in person. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. 
actually the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always.